Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this Leading with the Will to Win live web conversation. I'm Leo Tillman. It is my distinct pleasure to be co-hosting this event with Richard Gelfand, who is the CEO of IMAX Corporation. Richard, who is a longtime colleague and friend, is a visionary leader and thinker, and I'm so excited to have this opportunity for Richard to share his perspective uh, about leading and developing strategy and keeping organizations together in a crisis. We have a great group of executive board members, senior professionals from around the world, so excited to, to have this conversation. In terms of logistics, uh, we will have a prepared portion uh, where Richard and I will cover a number of topics that we believe will be of, of interest and relevance to a wide range of organizations. And then we will take some questions. You can email them to live at lmtillman.com. That email address should be in your confirmation letter. We received a few already, and it's going to be fascinating. So Richard, so delighted to have you here. Um, this is a, a time where we're all trying to understand what's going on and shape the path to the future. How are things at, at IMAX? What are you guys are focusing on? Well, how are things at IMAX is, uh, is um, leading like how is the play Mrs. Lincoln, Leo, because um, every IMAX theater in the world, except for a handful, are closed. And um, we've been in a zero revenue environment since around March 15th, about two months. Um, there are still three countries that are open a little bit, which is um, Taiwan, um, parts of Korea, and um, Hong Kong. Uh, but other than that, we're in pretty much a shutdown. But as we'll get into in this conversation, you know, we don't really approach life in a binary way. So even though um, I'll go back to my Mrs. Lincoln analogy, you know, the play is okay. It's not as bad as you would think. So we're using this time to try and envision what IMAX of the future looks like, how we can improve IMAX of the present and make sure on, we're on solid footing. Look, it's no secret that I've been fascinated with the firm for a long time, and that's why General Jacobi and I did a, the whole case study on IMAX in our recent book, Agility. So in it, what was striking about it is that this company was totally below the radar screen before you took it over, and then you created this disruptive, bold vision, and you, you went to implement it and become a major player in the entertainment industry, um, transform business models, transform relationships with different counterparties. But this all took place in this environment that Clausewitz would describe as fog and friction, economic recessions, adversaries, market shocks. So you've been there before. Um, what is the secret sauce of not just trying to persevere in environments like these, but truly think strategically and turn them into opportunities? I think it's a combination of things, Leo. I think one of them is not to take no for an answer. Um, one of my employees once said to me, he's no longer with us because he's no longer with IMAX, but he said, um, you know, Rich, I can't stand the way you manage. It's like you write a book and you write the introductory chapter, you write the middle and you write the end and you expect me to execute on that. But there's a lot of uh, issues and a lot of problems, and you don't pay attention to that. You tell me where I want, where you want me to go, rather than all the elements of how to get there. So I think that's somewhat of our philosophy, Leo. Is we don't take no for an answer. I also think there is a um, maybe. Maybe I'll be a little uh, self-deprecating about it, but maybe we're a little naive in not in not understanding all the time the obstacles that are in front of us. So I bought the company with a partner about 26 years ago in an LBO, and we were gonna change the entertainment landscape. And um, it turned out after we bought it, there were a lot of details and things that we didn't really understand. And it was a lot harder to break the status quo than we envisioned on the outside. But somehow the way my mind works, it's. You know, I see those kinds of things as a little bit of a distraction. And I keep my eye focused on 
where the goal line is and try and tune out a lot of the noise along the way. And as I said, you know, half joking with you, at the beginning, um, in bad times, I do think it's obvious what the bad things are and it's easy to focus on those. But I think you have to tune your brain on what the opportunities are and roughly how to get there and get the people around you to believe in them and then set out the roadmap to do it. And that's the philosophy we always have. So, so again, about 20 years ago, major recession, huge shock to the uh, exhibition market, et cetera, et cetera. You had other things where stock price dived by 50% in a day. Uh, how is this crisis different from what you have experienced? Well, for us, one of the differences is that we have a strong balance sheet. So right now we have about $350 million in cash and we burn about $10 million a month in zero revenue. So we have a long time to get through this. Um, the other crisis we have, and when I had in 2000, 2001, um, and when I say it, I can't even believe it, but we had $350 million in EBITDA and we had $10 million in debt. So, I mean, this is a luxury, this crisis, in terms of you know, where we're sitting in the world. So th that's one place. The second thing is the, um, the first crisis, which was the meltdown of the global exhibition industry, and literally virtually every major chain went bankrupt or restructured. Um, so it, it, there was a financial way out of it. This crisis, is a health-related crisis, a biological crisis. So it's harder to see a linear way out of it. Um, won't surprise you, Leo, but consistent with the way I approach the business, I approach um, elements of life. And I do happen to believe, um, and I, you know, I'm not naive about this, I talk to a lot of people that in a reasonable amount of time, there'll either be treatment or a vaccine in the world will return to normal. So in this one, I could kind of see a time frame, and you could divide that in two parts. There's a time frame to reopen theaters, but there's a time frame to some semblance of normal. And I spend less time worried about the short term. When are the theaters going to open? How long are they going to be open for? Um, because I have the luxury of a strong balance sheet. And I'm quite a bit more focused on you know, when we get through the worst of this crisis, you know, what does the entertainment landscape look like? Um, what does our company look like? Um, how can we become more efficient? How can we look at new businesses we haven't looked at yet? And, you know, ironically, and many people would think we were a little bit um, out of our minds for doing this, but on certain initiatives, we even up spending now because it provides, you can get services cheaper during a, a, a pandemic like this. You can get resources you couldn't otherwise get. So this one is just a very different perspective. In the last one, you know, our survival was somewhat at stake. In this one, it would take very extraordinary circumstances to threaten our survival. I was, I was going to, um, to ask you a bit more about it. So uh, the vast majority of companies that we speak to that we know of spend the past few months making sure that their people can work and function from home and that they're safe. But the vast majority of activities have been purely defensive, cutting costs, delaying every single investment and m and they could think of, thinking about supply chains. Um, you were doing quite the, in, in cutting, cutting, cutting uh, people and costs. You, you're doing quite the opposite. You, you kept the company together. You avoided layoffs. You're thinking about actually investing. Tell us more. Yeah, I think, um, I think the fact we went through this once before was somewhat helpful that, that we, we lived through it. Also, Leo, I mean, when I gave you the financial status of um, cash burn and cash on hand, I came to the conclusion that um, making a lot of cuts wasn't gonna fundamentally make a difference in whether we survived or not. And if this gets worse, we have the option 
to cut deeper if we feel like doing that. But I thought when I looked farther out that what we were gonna be as a company was more dependent on how we use the time and what our investments were on and whether how we used our personnel during this time. So you raised the point about not really um, laying anyone off, which we haven't. We, we went to a four day work week in some cases and um, in a few cases, uh, three or four day week. But the reason for that is I, I, I certainly felt having a family values, not to use an overused terminology in a different way, but I felt like um, we run this like, like a family business in a way. And I felt keeping people on in the long term was going to be something that they would remember and they would um, appreciate. So that was part of it. The other part of it was, could we really keep all of these people engaged? Was there enough for them to do? Because certainly we weren't going to spend the money on keeping everybody unless there was, um, they could be doing useful things. And we, um, we, we, the, the key to that is largely communication. Um, so our management team, um, we started with three calls a week and now we have two calls a week. And then I created another sort of, it's not the name, but it's effectively an innovation committee that meets once a week. And we take the messages that we want for everyone in the projects and we go out from that central point. And then in following weeks, we report back. So what's happened in the innovation area, what's happened in the management area, are people really engaged? And then we also do a little less than once a week, a global call with all of our employees. And um, we have offices probably in seven or eight countries, but we operate in over 80 countries. So we also feel like direct content, contact, especially from me, is important because I think they need to hear a little bit of their vision. It's fine and it's important that it get filtered in the organization, but I think they need to hear it from the leader. And I also think people are smart enough um, to know if people are um, not being truthful with them. So I think when they hear me um, you know, say what I'm thinking and what the vision is, and by nature, I tend to try and be very direct. So I don't sugarcoat it either. So if people say, when the theater's open, is this all going to be fine and wonderful? I, I say, I don't know. It's a virus. You know, we're going to have to see what happens. And I talk about, you know, positioning ourselves to succeed if it is fine, but how to position ourselves if it isn't fine. And I just think the whole organization um, over time benefits when you deal really straight with them. I think they could smell a rattle uh, um, far away. Absolutely. You bring up so many points that, are, that were critical to General Jacoby and I in shaping uh, this theory of agility. One, the role of authentic leadership and the role of leaders in shaping this strategic and moral true north for the organization in living it rather than saying it. That, that's hugely important. The bias for offense. Uh, but you also emphasize one more point that is critical, which is the relationship between resilience and agility, right? By coming into this crisis with this fortress balance sheet, as people in finance love to say, um, you essentially gave yourself the ability to be agile organizationally and strategically um, as opportunities present. So that's, that's a huge point. I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about not the strategy, but rather organizational functioning. Uh, you already mentioned it when you said that you give someone a direction and then you let them be and let them execute. Um, what was so fascinating uh, when we did the case study on, on you guys in, the, in our book was not just strategic agility, vision, business model transformations, new markets, and so on, but it was the tactical agility. You guys came up with hundreds of groundbreaking innovations throughout all of this, digital remastering, 3D movies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that requires the entire organization to feel in energized, empowered, trusting their leaders, 
So tell us more about this cultural setting that you've been trying to cultivate uh, throughout and, and in this crisis too. I think in a way, Leo, I would sum it up by saying that risk is okay and that failure is okay. So I'm glad you remember we tried a lot of things, but to be clear, a lot of them didn't work. We tried a foray into virtual reality um, that didn't work. Um, it w we, we set it up in a measured way so we wouldn't spend that much money if it didn't work and gave it a real test. Um, we actually had a, a cycling studio um, before Peloton where you would have like an IMAX theater behind you and you would cycle to the music and, and the images and um, that didn't work. There's a whole litany of them. But um, there's, there's a price um, for failure and that's if you were careless or that's if you weren't truthful and that's if you try to be manipulative. But if you kind of play it straight and we all understand the risk going into it and it doesn't work, then you know, that's on all of us, including me. And you, know, you, you never could predict what consumer behavior is going to be. And um, you have to be willing to be a little bit patient for a while. Now that's somewhat difficult in the context of being a small public company because um, you know, I could show you the, the notes and the analyst notes that said, you know, uh, this idiot failed in doing virtual reality. But in fact, in doing virtual reality, I think we lost something like $10 million, which is small. And we did 10 projects in different countries with different dynamics. And you know, if it had worked, it could have been a, a really big business. So um, maybe the way to verbalize it is that there's a, a little bit of a disproportionate risk reward curve when we go down that road. So we can take a small risk and if it doesn't work, we say that's okay. But we try and make sure there's a big payoff if that works. So to give an example, right now, um, we're in the process of launching um, something called IMAX Enhanced. And what that does is um, with large screen TVs in the home, um, we have a way to make the images look better in the home. And the aspect ratio on televisions is somewhat like a letterbox, whereas IMAX more fills the screen. And about a, a year ago, um, we launched this initiative. Our partner is Xperi and DTS. And our first um, consumer electronics partner was Sony. And then we used them as a content partner with Paramount. Anyway, I don't want to get too much in the details, but um, it's, it's quite small now. It's not a big initiative. Um, but if it works, it could be quite a large initiative. And um, you never know, but we're using this time now to talk to streaming services because obviously there's more content going in the home than before. And obviously the streaming services have their own competitive dynamic and we can, uh, maybe they could distinguish themselves from each other if we can enhance their content in some way. Um, another initiative right now is we're a little behind the eight ball in terms of direct to consumer because we're a, a B2B model. So IMAX is embedded in Regal and AMC and Odeon theaters and they have the relationship with the consumer. But we recognize in this world, you need a relationship with a consumer. So we kind of had a phase two to three year project with a designated spend on it. and. Um, what we've done during this period of time is accelerated the timetable and accelerated the spend. And the reason we did that is we need outside vendors to do it and we recognize they would be more hungry for the work. So we went and rebid it at a better rate than we got before. And we recognize that our employees had downtime during this period of time so they could devote their time to a new initiative. So it's, it's really a culture of saying, you know, this disproportionate risk reward, and there's no penalties for failing as long as you play by the rules. So th this response was one of the reasons I truly wanted to have this conversation and bring it to colleagues and uh, clients around the world, because this is so different from 
a lot of what we hear. Survey after survey after survey uh, of CFOs say how they will eliminate all of these expenses, including R&D to hit earnings targets, how they would pre-sale at huge discounts uh, services just to hit this near term. And you seem to, to do the, the, the opposite. And in our conversations over the years, one of the ways that you and I phrased it is in terms of risk. What is the risk of not doing that? Would you comment on that? Of, of not doing? Um, of not investing, of not reacting this way in difficult times. Well, first, I, I think you'll find framing of it a little interesting, Leo, which is um, in a zero revenue environment, the street has no expectations for you. <laughs> so in a way, you're freed of those quarterly pressures. And, you know, most of the time we face them too. And we make um, short-sighted decisions that aren't wonderful. And we do it because we have to. That's the world we live in. And in some way, the straitjacket comes off in this environment because with no revenues, I mean, it's pretty hard to miss a number. I mean, you know, it's, uh, um, it's more about managing your cash and your balance sheet and your future. And I think the risk of not doing it is um, it's gonna open up someday. And that's why culturally, a lot of um, our colleagues and other companies and in Hollywood and even at IMAX are saying, you know, what day were we going to open and what's the um, occupancy going to be and how much are we going to make that day? And, um, you know, I, I've tried to say it's not really about the day we open or the month we open. It's the business we have after we open. And I don't, you know, you don't need necessarily to prove those things out on a grand scale. You can do a, a smaller project where the numbers either work or they don't. And that's how you get to the disproportionate risk reward. Another good example I left out before is we're exploring using live content at our theaters throughout the world. So it might be a concert, it might be a global premiere. And some of the people involved in my live business said, well, in order to test this out, we need you know, hundreds of theaters to launch it in. Otherwise we'll lose money in the short run, I said, you know, it's fine if we lose money in the short run, but we'll understand the model. So does it work or doesn't it work? And, you know, if it works, trust me, investors will understand the numbers and we'll have all the capital we need to build it out. But you don't have to build it out on a grand scale. Um, you could afford to experiment. And that's even more true in times like this. So one, you, I don't think you know about, Leo, but um, we were approached by Tribeca um, the, the film festival about a month ago. And they said, um, uh, are you guys interested in doing some drive-ins with us? Because drive-in business is really um, holding up because you don't have to social, socially distance, you're in a car, um, there are some smaller issues like food. And again, that's not a business that I think is gonna make a lot of money for us, but I think the opportunity to keep our brand in front of our consumers and also to help our consumers at the time when the world was shut um, seemed very appealing to us. And you know, we're, we're learning about it at that time. And again, to me, for non-financial reasons, that's another example of a different risk reward. I mean, the risk is we lose a little money, not a lot of money. And the reward is that you know, our brand gets wonderful exposure at a time when the public needs um, community and needs interpersonal interaction. It's interesting. You just answered one of the questions that just came in about the applications of IMAX in outside, outside theaters, et cetera. So that's, that's super interesting. You brought up another point, which frankly, I've never heard a convincing answer or comment on uh, ever. And that is, for some reason, uh, CEOs of tech companies believe that they can totally disregard Wall Street pressures on corporate earnings and do whatever is needed long term. And they're not particularly concerned uh, about the implications for near term valuations and so on. The it's the conventional wisdom 
that everybody else cannot do that. Do you agree? Um, that's a really tough one, Leo. And that is because I think when you don't earn, when you don't have a lot of earnings and you're a story stock and you have growth, I do think outside tech, um, you could do that. And there are examples. And again, I'm not familiar with their earnings, but you know, companies like Peloton now or like um, the delivery companies that don't have a history of earnings that are kind of do they're quasi tech companies, but they're doing it. But I think once you have earnings, then you're put in a group of comparables. And then the street is measuring, you know, what's your return on equity and what are your gross margins and what's your SG&A ratio and, you know, what's your CEO comp and, you know, all these measures. And if you, there's a whole industry of hedge funds and analysts that make their living on those disparities. So I do think that that's part of what causes you know, that focus in the non-tech industry. And for whatever reason, I guess it's because tech investors have done so well over a period of time um, that the street kind of says, you're in a different box, so it's okay if you play by the different set of rules. And it, you know, it's, it's kind of incredible. You look, at, um, you look at Netflix, which has only started to earn money is worth you know, multiples of the Walt Disney Company. And we probably could understand that now because of some of the um, challenges going on. And even Disney itself, even though they're going through those challenges, they're not held to that standard in the streaming service. And I think, I think it is liberating. Um, on the other hand, I do have to say, if you're kind of old fashioned, which I know you are and I am, to some extent, earning money at some point is kind of a good thing. And having earnings and returning money to shareholders is a good thing. So probably the answer lies somewhere in the middle. It's probably not responsible to not be cognizant of the results, but it's probably better if people could take a longer term focus. I was just struck with, with the words that you were using throughout, liberating, straitjacket. And that's how many have felt. So I wonder if this pandemic and everybody withdrawing earnings and saying, I don't know, um, is, is, may, may contribute to this trend of guiding earnings, et cetera, it remains to be seen. Um, let's switch, switch gears one more time. Um, obviously, you know, there, everything there is to know about the entertainment industry and, um, and your own firm. But let's step back and talk about the environment in general. I know you think quite a bit about um, economies and markets and geopolitics. Um, in our recent memo, we, we try to conceptualize for our clients how we think about uh, a lot of that. And we divided the outlook into three buckets. One is economics and finance, financial risks related to this pandemic. So what is, how deep is this recession going to be? how gradual this recovery is going to be, how many jobs we're going to lose, how it's going to transform uh, the market environment, uh, et cetera. So that's one bucket. The second bucket is what are some of the long-term potential secular trends that are going to come out of this pandemic? Uh, you could have a profound change in social norms and customer preferences. You could have changes in the future of work and learning, acceleration of some of the uh, technology trends and the rise of nationalism and populism uh, for, for obvious reasons. In the third bucket, bucket is a geopolitical environment where it seems that the conflict is intensifying for a variety of ways and the diversification of supply chains is to come. How do you think about uh, the current environment? What are your general views on, on all of that? So the one that is the most interesting to me is the second one about trends, what's going to happen to trends. And, um, you know, as a general matter, Leo, and this may be a, um, a shortcoming of mine, I, 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 especially in the entertainment business, people love trends. So if there's a good tornado movie, you could be sure there's going to be three tornado movies the next year. And then, um, when one of them doesn't work, they're going to say, fire someone 
who's the idiot that did the tornado movie? Because one of the advantages of trends is it lowers your personal risk, right? You can say, that was the trend, that I'm being part of that trend. So I do think um, it, you know, it depends to some extent on how long the shutdowns last for and the social distancing. But I think it takes a long time um, to change a trend. So a, an industry I know well, entertainment and movies, people are saying, well, with streaming and um, you know, staying at home, are they ever gonna go to the movies again? And I like to remember my trip to Pompeii um, where people went to theaters um, to, he to get an entertainment, you know, thousands of years ago. I don't think um, the invention of Netflix is going to change thousands of years of human behavior. And I would even say that maybe the other way, um, my wife, who I love dearly, but sitting on the couch with her every night watching different streaming things for the umpteenth time, we want to rip the doors off and go out and do something different. So um, I, I don't think that a lot of the historical behavior is permanently changed because of the circumstance. On the other hand, I've heard a lot of smart people say it, and I think they're right. I do think some pre-existing trends um, will continue um, and accelerate because of this. So, you know, for example, shopping online is, you know, one of the easiest ones. Um, we've shopped online for a while, but a lot of people don't. And I think once you discover the convenience of shopping online, that's really going to be a long-term trend that's going to accelerate. Um, you know, I think probably it's going to lead to changing malls a lot faster than, 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 than people had thought about. Um, so that's kind of what I think about that. And geopolitical, one of the things you didn't mention um, um, when we talked at the beginning in the introduction is that I have a very large presence in China. We have 700 theaters in China. It's our largest territory in the world, including the United States. And uh, for an IMAX film, we're 10% of the Chinese box office. So I understand it you know, fairly well. I'll start by saying it, I hope it doesn't lead to strains in geopolitics because I think um, you look at numbers like people being lifted out of poverty and all kinds of measures, you know, disease before this, a lot of other things. There were so many positives coming out of um, interacting more with other countries and opening borders and whatnot. I think in the short run, it definitely will um, influence the geopolitics and in, in probably not a very good way. And I think that's accelerated um, by the election year going on now. However, I hope the Chinese, and I believe they are sophisticated enough to understand that it's a US election year and certain things um, flow from that. So I guess I would see it as a wave. Leo, I think it'll get a little bit worse right now, the geopolitical situation, but I think over time, I think it'll come back as, as the world comes back. And then the first area you mentioned, which was you know, economy, finance, again, this is an easy answer, uh, but it, it depends on the duration of this. But I think we're incredibly adaptive as human beings. Um, a friend of mine who is a fairly well-known infectious disease doctor who strongly believes they're gonna be a treatment or a, a vaccine thinks the coronavirus is gonna be a trivia question a year from now. And you know, God hope he's right. And he was exaggerating to make a point. But I think to the extent it does come under control, and in my vocabulary of under control, it means a treatment that more or less takes death off the table. So the stakes are a lot lower for individuals and they start um, to return to normal. I, I just think people adapt, so 9-11, which certainly has changed a lot of things, whether it's security at buildings or how you board aircraft and all kinds of things. We learn to adapt to that. And when it first happened, I was one of the people that said, how are we gonna absorb all those costs? How, you know, they, we're gonna go into a recession. That, but somehow the economy figured out how to absorb those costs and adapt 
to those changes, whereas, you know, before all this happened, the economy was extremely strong in the market. So I think there will be permanent changes, whether it's temperatures or mass or whatever it is. But I think we're in, back to your point about what makes companies special is their agility. I think part of what makes the United States special is its agility. And I think if it's not too long and too debilitating, we will adapt. Look, I, I agree. And it, it's interesting that um, General Jacoby and I ended the book by saying that agility, A, is universal. And B, it's been a human aspiration for a very long period of time. Across the board, individually, organizationally, armies, governments. And that's exactly what, what is needed. And, and our premise was um, this pandemic is just an illustration of the kinds of shocks that our societies, our organizations will keep facing repeatedly. So what makes organizations capable of detecting, assessing, and responding to, to threats and disruptions of entirely different nature, some geopolitical, some biological, some technological, et cetera, et cetera. So what advice would you give to people who manage teams or people who manage entire enterprises what will make them agile in this way? What will make them able to navigate uncertainty and disruption of different kinds, probably for the rest of our careers? I think you have to start by having a healthy skepticism for the status quo. So I think if you believe something's gonna last forever, it's easy to get sloppy and to say, well, and by the way, I think I was guilty of that. At one point in IMAX's development, we were growing like crazy and there was some warning signs that we needed to do things differently, but I think I was a little bit too caught up in our success to see those warning signs. So I think you have to create a culture and um, leaders are really important. They have to be part of it where they don't get complacent and they don't, um, and they're open um, to seeing um, the cracks in their own armor when things happen. And I think also you have to create a, a reward system internally where you don't just reward people who say, you know, you're the greatest. So let's face it, that everybody wants to hear it. That's a nice thing. But you have to encourage people to speak up and say, wait a minute, you know, what about this and what about that? And that's not exactly um, what I think. And I also think you, maybe one of the more important things is you have to um, kind of reward the outlier and the disruptor and encourage it as an example so the organization um, sees it. So I don't want to get too far off point, but it's a very illustrative point. Um, 25 years ago, um, there was a, an engineer at IMAX who the movie Toy Story was just coming out and he caught me in the hallway and he said, you know, the way that was filmed was a 3D model. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a 3D set in a computer. And I think I could play with the camera in the computer and create real 3D content. And I said, um, that's really interesting. How much money do you need to test that? And it wasn't a lot. And he tested it and it really worked. And I've kind of internally told that story a lot of times and used it in an illustrative way. So you make heroes out of people who come up with innovative ideas and, and follow them through. And I think that's an important because if you just make heroes out of people whose unit delivered the most profit that quarter or who, you know, cut margin, who increase margins or cut spending, that sets up one kind of organization. I think if you create other heroes, that sets up a different kind of organization. You know, you bring up these super important cultural points. I, I always love this Toy Story example. We actually used it, used it in the book. But think of what, what it says, right? First of all, this engineer perceived himself to be in the business of looking for opportunities like these, right? He was not just executing, he was thinking about it. Secondly, he trusted you to stop you in the hallway and voice an opinion. And of course, you trusted him to place, to place this uh, trust and in, in invest in, in, in his idea. 
So this entire, that's what I was trying to also get in one of the previous questions about the culture of empowerment, trust, honesty, and all of that. that, that I, I've always loved that example. From what I remember, it ushered in an entirely new era in 3D, in 3D movies, right? It did. Um, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who ran DreamWorks at the time, credited that with ushering in the era of modern 3D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so before we switch to uh, a few questions which are interesting, let me just remind everybody, uh, please email your questions to live at lmtillman.com and we, we would love to take them. Richard Brady answered a few that have to do with outdoor applications of, of iMac, but also at home applications of iMac. So um, he, here's one question which, which I think is super interesting. Um, I'm wondering if IMAX theaters could benefit from the development of esports and could provide a venue for the younger generations in gaming competitions. That would require some agility, but can, can you make this work? Would that make sense? So before I alluded to the fact that we were doing IMAX Live, we were playing around with it. And one of the areas that we're testing is esports, actually. And the, the numbers are crazy in terms of places like Madison Square Garden or um, the Staples Center that gets sold out to watch people play. Um, so in terms of this idea of putting live in, in theaters, we've, we actually um, partnered with someone who knows this area well, and we're trying to see whether there's a market there where you could show regional tournaments, final tournaments, um, you know, first as a spectator sport and whether that would be interesting. And then, as you say, Leo, you could layer levels on it. Gambling has been coming more illegal in more places. So could you layer gambling on it at some point? If we introduce the element of interactivity to our theaters, which is something we're looking at using telephones or other things, could you actually play multiplayer games on a screen? And could your theater in Shanghai play your theater in Las Vegas and um, you know things like that? Some of those um, are obviously they have to be, they need a foundation to be built upon. But we are starting to look at building on that. And we've had discussions, esports in Asia, as you know, and you probably know in the questioner is much farther along than here. Um, so we're looking at different tests that we could do on a smaller scale with eSports in Asia. And um, we've, we tested um, soccer as a spectator sport, live soccer in a number of theaters. Um, we tested um, NHL hockey um, in, one, in, 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 in a few theaters. So I definitely think eSports is interesting and that's an area, Leo, back to what we were talking about before, where there's, in, in my opinion, a disproportionate risk-reward curve. It's a good example. You can test it in regions. You can test it in theaters. I don't have to test it in a thousand places at once. And if it works, then you could expand it, and it could be a really good business. Got it. Um, so the next question, I think, is super interesting. Um, because it will bring up some, some memories for you. Uh, when we were doing uh, the case study on IMAX, I recall that you have to navigate this very complex Hollywood ecosystem. You created this vision to become a key player, but your value proposition, your position in the value chain was tricky in between movie studios and exhibitors, and you had to uh, create a value proposition for them, you, you redefine your business model, it was super interesting. So, so here's the question. With the Paramount consent decree being terminated late, late last year, it now opens the door for film studios to enter the exhibition market. I personally think that having the entire cinema experience owned by the studio could make it more controlled and immersive experience for film goers. What are your thoughts on studios entering the exhibition market? So I think the Paramount decree 
going away wasn't as big a deal as the media made it. Because I think the world's been moving in that direction for a while. And for example, streaming companies um, like Netflix were rumored to have looked at, um, at uh, exhibition companies. So a lot of the kinds of things that you know, could have happened, probably could have happened even before the decree, you know, Apple could buy somebody or Amazon could buy somebody, which, which is a similar dynamic. Um, I think for studios, it's a little bit complicated because um, they're a little bit like Switzerland. So they're friends with AMC, they're friends with Regal, they're friends with Toho in Japan, they're friends with Wanda in China. And, um, you know, there's access to a lot of information because they're non-partial and you distribute a blockbuster by going globally in a big way. If you are allied with one exhibition chain, that becomes a little bit more complicated. It's not impossible because if you look at that industry at a different level, so Warner Brothers, I think, made Friends and Friends was on NBC. So there's a little bit of a history of getting around conflicts like that. But I think that one um, would be a little bit dicey. And then you also have the question of filmmakers work for different studios. So, you know, big name filmmakers, Steven Spielberg has worked for a lot of different studios on his projects. Is he, how's he gonna feel if his movies are only released at this theater chain and not that theater chain? Um, with that said though, at a, at, at a broader level, um, a longer term trend seems to be um, the technology world and the real world and you know, the most notable example is Whole Foods and Amazon, or although there are a lot of other ones, Barnes and Noble going back into real bookstores. And it's kind of ironic that um, the streaming companies, um, you know, what they're doing is just distributing in a different way. So um, when television came along, that was a different method of distribution of movies. Um, DVDs was a different method of distribution. So streaming is a different method of distribution. However, the streaming companies have also gone into production and content creation. And, you know, those are tough barriers to break down. And Netflix has done a very good job on the TV side of it, on the movie side of it. Theaters won't play their movies. It's more complicated. So it, it would surprise me less to see some of the streaming companies um, start to consolidate with some of the traditional exhibition companies than it would for the studios to. And you know, that's something that we IMAX have thought about long term. If you look out into your future and you look at the use of data as a way to market and you look at theatrical as a way to advertise your own content and distinguish yourself in a more um, concentrated marketplace. So I think that's the area that is more likely to me than studios. Got it. Any questions? So um, would love to hear your parting word, uh, takeaways, advice for, for the listener. So my favorite saying, and at IMAX, it's become like, um, some people even had a, like a, uh, a parody of a little red book. Um, you know, Mao's favorite sayings, Rich's favorite saying of all is it's not as good as it looks or as bad as it seems. And I use that as a very tempering principle because, and it ties to some of the answers that I gave you, Leo. So when everyone's celebrating how amazing our business is and how durable and it's going to last forever. I say it's not as good as it looks. And when we're, we're in a time like this, where it's easy to get down and say the world is ending, I'll say it's not as bad as it seems. So I think that would be um, my final statement um, for this group, which would be it's definitely not as bad as it seems right now. And I think it's hard to see our way out. And I think linear thinking probably isn't the best way out of this thing. But a fort fortunately, there's a lot of people in the world thinking in non 
linear ways now, and I think we will get out of it. Well, I can't thank you enough. I, um, you know, we have, we have had these types of conversations over the years, and I've always been fascinated with your perspective, and and this this kind of a again bias for offense, looking for opportunities given given where you have been. So I really appreciate you coming and sharing your perspective and thanks to everybody for for listening for participating i hope you found it useful and look forward to continuing the conversation in a variety of ways thanks thank so much you, goodbye